The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Remember the smell of hot buttered popcorn, the anticipation as the lights go down and the trailers begin to play. It's been way too long since we could all go to the movies. Tonight, Steve finds out how that's hit theaters and the film biz at the box office and beyond. Then, with the Hot Dogs Podcast Festival underway, we revisit my conversation from earlier in the season with Tanya Talega about her podcast on the seven truths that help guide Anishinaabe life. It's Thursday, January 28th, and that's next on The Agenda. With movie theaters shuttered across much of North America due to the pandemic, there is trepidation out there about what the future looks like for the silver screen and the cinemas that house them. Will streaming overtake the in-person theater experience for film buffs, or can movie houses bounce back? With us to consider that, we welcome, in Picton, Ontario, Alexandra Say. She's the general manager of the Regent Theatre. In Niagara Falls, Ontario, filmmaker April Mullen, director of the recently released thriller Wander. In the beaches in the capital city, there's Peter Howell, movie critic for the Toronto Star and president of the Toronto Film Critics Association. And in downtown TO, Dan Peel, operator of the Royal Cinema. Uh, great to have all of you four on TVO tonight. I want to just set up our conversation by reading some numbers here that are, frankly, quite staggering. Uh, here we go. The global cinema industry is set to lose $32 billion in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. That's a 71.5% reduction in box office revenue compared to 2019. That according to a recent report by media and tech research firm Omdia. Peter, when you examine the movie industry landscape, I mean, that number says something, but from your vantage point, how bleak does it look right now? Uh, it's as bleak as the bleakest horror movie you could imagine. But um, I think that, uh, you know, interestingly enough, the executives of some of the major firms, they're, they're treating it more like a thriller. They're hoping that they'll come out at the end and, you know, Harrison Ford will save the world. Like, for example, El Ellis Jacob of Cineplex, I've read an interview with him. He's very bullish on what's going to happen once the vaccines are, are widely available. He thinks people will return to theaters. And Adam Aaron of AMC, they managed to stave off bankruptcy last week with a big cash infusion. And he's optimistic for the rest of the year. So uh, it, it's hard to argue with that. OK, well, let's put that optimism in our back pockets for the moment. We're still going to set up what's going on out there. And then we'll find out later on if we have reason to be optimism, optimistic. rather. April, before I ask you a question, wh yes. why don't we do this? Let's show a clip of your film, OK? Is that a good idea? Sounds let's show good. It. Let's show everybody what you've been up to. Sheldon, if you would, this is from Wander. You killed my daughter and destroyed my family. I don't know who you are, but I'm coming for you. You're a good man, Arthur. A silent warrior. I am powerful. I am protected. I've always had a gut feeling that there was some link between here and what happened to your family. Mm, Tommy Lee Jones, and, and you are here to tell the tale that you worked with Tommy Lee Jones and survived the experience. Well done. Uh, tell me this, though. From the time you started thinking about this movie, working on this movie, filming this movie, doing the whole nine yards, how much time did that take? Five full years of dedication, focus, and uh, never giving up. And after five full years of that kind of effort, the knowledge that this movie is not going to have the big screen portrayal that you would have hoped for. How problematic is that for you? You know, coming out of the gate, we were hoping to make it through and we were postponed by two months because of COVID. All of our post houses were down. We had to do remote color correction, sound design, and everything was done remotely. We were behind on our deadlines, of course, by two months. And then there was the festival release and we were hoping to go to Cannes and Cannes as well had you know, had to put everything on hold because of COVID as well as the director's fortnight, which in an indie film world with indie producers, that is our launching pad. So that's where we get to set the film up for the whole world and for everyone to see it. So, you know, we had to reinvent what we were 
envisioning for the film and how to get it out there faster for people with you know the need of content in the new world that we were facing was it just an awful kick in the gut Behind closed doors, it was a big kick in the gut because <laughs> of five years, you know, is a long time. You want to celebrate with the audience. That's what we make movies for. We want to celebrate and enjoy the film and watch others, you know, in a community setting to uh, see the film on the big screen. But uh, there's always tomorrow and we're working, you know, working our butts off again to get the next film going. Annie did say that. The sun will come out tomorrow. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> Alexandra, tell us what you've been doing at the Regent Theatre over the past 10 months. Well, we closed like all the other theaters in March of last year, but since then we've been really very busy. We, like many other organizations, have pivoted. Uh, in our case, we have equipped ourselves to live stream. We are not only a cinema, but we're also a live music venue, and, and so we can now live stream our performances uh, with or without an audience. And so that's something that we've been focusing a lot on recently. We've also run a major fundraising campaign to get us through this and to um, improve the accessibility of our theater, moving more towards creating a cinema, a cinema experience. Um, because I think when we come back from this um, COVID time, the new normal will be an audience that desires a different experience that they can't get at home. It's more than just the content they're seeing on the big screen. It's got to be the whole experience that comes with it. And so we're working hard to get ahead of that and to make our theater, um, both in terms of our, um, our physical auditorium, as well as our bar and concession, more uh, of an experience for our audience. Understood. Now, I, I see how the fundraiser would bring in money, but what about the content and the programming? Does that bring in any revenue for you? At the moment, there's very limited programming that we're able to do, um, and virtual streams of films is also something we've been doing, but that is not a moneymaker by any stretch of the imagination. It's a more of a community engagement tactic for us to keep our communities um, engaged with us and engaged with the kind of content that we would typically be producing on the big screen. Gotcha. Dan, what's been going on at the Royal for the last 10 months? Now, uh, basically the same thing as the region. We've been closed since March to the public. We have taken this opportunity to uh, start renovating the theater, the plaster, the paint, all that sort of thing has been uh, worked on and it's really looking beautiful. Um, we are as well pivoting to a kind of a live streaming format with uh, 4K remote cameras. Oh, we have all new LED lighting, so hopefully we'll be able, uh, like the Regent, to stream uh, live performances, whether it be concerts or, uh, or um, um, a theater, live theater, that sort of thing. Uh, in our business model, when we acquired the Royal 15 years ago, we incorporated a post-production facility within the venue as well. So the large stage, the large theater, we can actually use as a mixing theater and have been since then, uh, albeit uh, movie independent film has been drastically reduced since March. Uh, it is starting to come back now and we're seeing signs of bookings for, for that type of uh, work uh, in the short future here. Those things you just mentioned don't sound cheap. How much money have you had to spend to do all that? Uh, <laughs> we've spent quite a bit. Um, the, the owner of the Royal is a philanthropist. He believes in the Royal, um, in its location on College Street and, and what it does and what it had been doing for the independent filmmaker community and, and the general community, uh, the public. So he's, he's kept going and kept his commitment to uh, make it as beautiful as we can. I didn't, um, I didn't hear a number there, Dan. You want to say a number? You don't have to if you don't want to, but I am going to ask. I won't comment on the number. <laughs> okay. Have you had it's to lay large. anybody off? <laughs> it's large. Uh, well, certainly uh, our programming staff has been idled uh, since March. Uh, our concession staff, obviously, the, the place is dark. Other than the workmen that are there painting and plastering, uh, we don't have our, our family working there right now. Alexandra, how about you? Have you had to lay people off? We have had to put people on hiatus. We have had to lay some people off. We operate with a largely volunteer um, front of house staff, and they have also been put on hiatus. So the challenge for us is keeping them engaged during this dark period. Right. Peter, do you have any idea or have you heard whether or not when the theaters were still allowed to be open, and they were open for a time after COVID had hit after all, right? The first case of COVID is December. Uh, and uh, the theaters were allowed to be open until, uh, I guess, March. Have you heard of anybody getting COVID-19 in a theater setting? 
No, I mean that's that's a point that a lot of theater owners make is that there uh, there's very there, there's I, I think there's like almost zero across North America, which is one of the reasons why they're so upset about uh, like in Ontario, for example, the drive-in theaters have been closed under this current lockdown. That doesn't make any sense at all. But um, you know, they, I know the theater exhibitors and, and the, the filmmakers are all they don't understand why theaters have been included in the same restrictions you find elsewhere. Hmm. April, can you tell us now? Given that you won't be able to release this on the silver screen as you had hoped, your movie Wander, what's the plan now to get mm -hmm. it out in front of people's eyeballs? So it's been released on all on-demand platforms and digital platforms North American wide. And to stand out in a very, you know, very busy platform, you have to make your mark. So we had a lot of press, a lot of lead up. People like Peter Howell, critics really matter. Rotten Tomatoes matters more than ever. You know, Twitter, Instagram, all the social aspects to sort of get the word of mouth and the buzz going is all we have. So you really have to try to implement new and innovative ways to get your film to stand out on a, on a new platform without the visuals, like, you know, heading into the subway and you see the poster of Wander that really makes an impact. So how do you stand out in a very, very busy screen world is the next challenge. That's it. I mean, you're, you're up against literally thousands and thousands of, of movie titles on things, you know, on the streaming services. Uh, I don't yes. know which ones you're on and which ones you're not, but I mean, is it, is it doubly difficult to try to get attention in this universe as opposed to in the previous universe when you could be on the, the theater screens? I think it's equally you know, difficult as an independent film coming up against big blockbusters. I think the landscape is always vast and people will choose and gravitate toward the content they want. So you just have to make sure they can see your film uh, and it's available on the platform that they choose. It's kind of like an on-demand consumerism right now and they want it when they want it, at the time they want it, and you just have to make sure that wanders an option. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, maybe they saw, you know, some of the interviews on, you know, the Today Show and all of those things matter, I think, because we're all connected through media right now. Gotcha. Peter, have you, I don't know, in my life, I can't ever recall a time when the theaters have been dark for this long a period of time, this kind of almost existential hit to the movie business. Can you recall anything similar? Well, not in my lifetime, though. If you, if you go back 100 years to the Spanish flu of uh, you know, the, the, early the early 1900s you, you, or the early 20th century, but I, 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 there's absolutely nothing to compare with it. I mean, I guess you could talk about how the advent of television, you know, in the 50s and 60s, how that um, had a big effect. A lot of theaters closed through that, but um, if this is nothing. Com that was nothing compared to what's happening now. So based on what you're hearing, mm -hmm. how able are the people who run the movie business? What kinds of ideas are they coming up with to, to roll with these punches? Well, they're being really resourceful, as you can hear from uh, Alexandra and Dan. And also, there's, I, I think there does seem to be a trend now that you'll see the smaller movie houses or the single screen type movie houses will become all event spaces. Like, for example, the Paradise Theater in, uh, on Bathurst Street re reopened, or actually on Bloor Street in Toronto, it reopened after decades being closed. It opened in December 2019, and it had to close like three months later. It's an absolutely beautiful Art Deco building now. And I know they, they, they're just itching to go with uh, what they can do. So I, I think everybody's in a state of suspended animation, hoping that they can last long enough for everybody to get vaccinated and, and go back. And I think the crowds will go back. I think people will return to theaters. They want to. I, I went to the Paradise Theater last year, obviously before the pandemic hit. It is gorgeous. They've done a fabulous job yeah, bringing that place back. And it's really yep. wonderful. Alexandra, give it, let's do a little sort of before and after. Before the pandemic, uh, what could people expect uh, out of a night at the region? Well, um, I'll get to that, but I should just riff off something Peter just said. He managed the Spanish flu in 1918. We, were actually, we actually opened our doors for the very first time in 1918. And we survived that pandemic. So I have every confidence that we're going to survive this pandemic too. Here, here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, pre-pandemic uh, at the Regent, we uh, were a very um, low-fi, let's say. We're a low-fi space. We operate on a cash basis. You get a physical ticket. You get a friendly volunteer who shows you to your seat. You get. We have all the normal concession offerings, uh, popcorn, and every chocolate bar you can possibly think of. Um, it's a it's a, her, a vintage experience in our space, um, and it's one that local county folk who have grown up here have grown up with. It's very close to home for a lot of people. We are the community local, and, and so we need to preserve that moving forward. 
But moving forwards, what we're doing is we are elevating the tone and texture of the space, if you will. We are reconfiguring our bar so that it can host events as a standalone space, for example. Our heritage is also Art Deco, and much like the Paradise, although with a smaller budget, um, we too are really embracing that heritage and uplifting the space so that it can be a uh, an event space and a place where you can have a glass of bubbly or a fancy cocktail before the show and then go into the show, whether it's a movie or whether it's a live show. Gotcha. Now, I'm here at the corner of Young and Eglinton right now, and probably within... 25 yards of where I'm sitting right now, there are 20 screens. Uh, not open right now, obviously, but on a normal occasion there are. Do I, do I assume, Alexandria, you're the, only, you're the only game in town for a long way around? We are the only game in town. You gotta go to Belleville, <laughs> which is <laughs> pretty far for the county, for county folk. You gotta go far to get another cinema. In fact, you have to go that far to get another purpose-built performance space. We're the only game in town. And, and I, I, I also assume you're one screen, not multiplex? That's correct. We are one screen. We have 450 approximately seats, uh, and we are one screen. Yes. Isn't that fabulous? You are what we would call the good old days. Today. The good old days are today. <laughs> we are, and we're trying to preserve that and move it forward into the 20th century. April, I saw you waving. What's that about? No, I was just applauding the fact that they're oh. still open and giving my gratitude. <laughs> That's a beautiful and, thing. And if, if I may, I'd, I'd love to just piggyback on something April said earlier, which is, you know, there's a dearth of content, but there's also a, a, a real window of opportunity, I think, in the near future for us, for us independent exhibitors, the region being one of them, to really give a leg up to Canadian filmmakers and Canadian artists um, during this window when we can't have large houses. Um, we have nothing to lose by taking what in normal times might be perceived as a chance on a Canadian film, on a longer run, on a big screen. And so uh, that's certainly something that we're prioritizing here at the region for when we can open doors. How's that sound to you, April? The Royal actually hosted my very first premiere of my very first film 15 years ago, Rock, Paper, Scissors, and it was an event where we brought college students from across the country where they performed on stage and then we showed the film. So theaters like that, you know, make or break for independent filmmakers in the country. Dan, I want to ask you about the fairness of the way things are right now. Uh, I think, and I can't remember how many months ago it was, it was for uh, Christopher Nolan's new movie, Tenet. I actually went to see that in a movie theater, and there were three of us in the movie theater. And I kept my mask on the whole time, who knows why, it's uh, whatever, there were 300 seats in there, and there were three people. Uh, it was at 10 o'clock at night showing. Do you think there was a way to keep cinemas open during the course of this lockdown and do it safely so that people would feel comfortable enough coming to the movies? I, I think so. I think from, from uh, the point that you just mentioned, in a, in, a, in a room of good size, you can space people out and, and keep them distanced and keep them safe. Unfortunately for the things like the Royal and the Regent, um, it's difficult if you're limited to 50 people, I think it was during the summer, that you were allowed to open. It's very challenging for us to, to make a go of it with only 50 people allowed in the room from a financial perspective. By the time you pay the distributors and pay the staff, uh, we don't have volunteer staff at the Royal, projectionists, cleaning staff, that sort of thing. So from a, from a, from a distancing perspective, yes, and from a financial model, no. <laughs> hmm. Alexandra, how about you? Was there a way to keep the cinemas open during the last 10 months, do it safely, and yet have you guys still make a living at the same time? I think there is a way for us to do that, or was a way potentially for us to have done that in the past. Um, we are in a slightly different position because we do operate with a lot of volunteers, but even so, it is not a money maker with 50 people in the house. Uh, so to make money on something, not so much. To break even, possibly. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's what we'll be coming back to, is a position where we're looking at breaking even, uh, not making money until we can have full capacity crowds again. Okay. Peter, I want to bring you in here and talk about the new business model that seems to be taking over the North American cinema situation, which is, for example, last month Warner Brothers announced that it's going to release its 2021 slate of movies simultaneously on streaming services and in theaters. Obviously, if the theaters aren't open, that doesn't matter. But this notion of 
of an exclusive window for cinemas to play movies before they go to streaming services, it looks like, well, it looks like that's disappearing. What do you think about all that? That, that, that was a seismic decision by Warners that has upset the industry quite a bit. I mean, you have major movies like Dune and The Matrix 4 that are going to appear on, online, never expected to be done that way. And, and the, Denis Villeneuve, the Canadian director who made Dune, he's extremely upset. He, he called Warners out over that. Um, you know, in Canada, for example, uh, it's kind of strange. We don't get HBO Max in Canada, so those movies will appear in theaters, but I think they'll also be heading to streaming a lot sooner. The problem is that it's um, it's it's an absolute uh, it, it's it's a crazy situation with streaming because it's very hard to know what's going to streaming, what's what's streaming in Canada, what's streaming in the U.S. It's just like the Wild West right now in terms of how you access the stuff. So even though there's an incredible amount of stuff out there, it's often hard to figure out where it is um, and which what will have a theater play, what won't, and and. Cool. The, the old, the old, what they used to call windows, where they'd be theaters, and then it would be uh, DVD, uh, Blu-ray, then it would be uh, online streaming. All those windows are collapsing; they're being broken, which is really shaking up the industry in a big way. And it's it's very hard to see where it's going to go. April, what's your view as a filmmaker on this exclusive window for cinemas that apparently now is disappearing? Uh, we lost the Blu-ray DVD window. It feels like, you know, seven years ago, and it, it is shrinking. The windows of revenue are shrinking. But I do believe that now that audience have had over a year of getting content when they want it on the platforms they want it, uh, we have to move with them. And even though, you know, films are created for the big screen, and I am a huge lover of the big screen, and there's something incredible to watch you know, the feeling of watching in a community, that's what we make films for. But uh, you also do, as the filmmakers and producers, have to give your content to the, you know, the consumers and where they want it at the time they want it, because now it's just kind of very immediate. And I don't think there's any going backwards because they've had a year of this kind of spoiled slash they can watch whatever they want whenever they want in their living room. And I think those theater lovers will still go to the theater because we love the grandness and the beautiful, you know, aspect of surround sound and watching it on the big screen, there's nothing like it. But for those who want to watch it on their iPad, they're going to do so whether or not, you know, the, they'll find a way. So if the windows shrink, hopefully the momentum of the film's release will just still be, you know, the momentum will happen and the word of mouth will happen and spread. And hopefully your film at the end of the day will be seen by even more viewers in different platforms with different revenues and it's just kind of reimagining that than ever before. Hmm. Well, here's what the director, Danny Villeneuve, had to say about all this. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this graphic up. People can read along. Streaming services are a positive and powerful addition to the movie and TV ecosystems. But I want the audience to understand that streaming alone can't sustain the film industry as we knew it before COVID. Streaming can produce great content, but not movies of Dune's scope and scale. Warner Brothers' decision means Dune won't have the chance to perform financially in order to be viable, and piracy will ultimately triumph. Warner Brothers might just have killed the Dune franchise. April, do you think he's right about that? I guess we'll have to see. It is tragic to have a film of such magnitude and such gorgeous grand landscapes, which is built and shot and shot listed, mm -hmm. For the big screen to have it condensed down to an iPad or a phone is just, and then the windows shrink and yeah, financially it, it might never be the same. But we do have to move with what's happening in the current times. It's difficult. It's a very difficult position to be in. Mm -hmm. Peter, what's your take on what Denny Villeneuve had to say? Uh, I I, uh, that, I agree. I you know I. Denis really loves the big screen, as do all movie critics. So it, it pains both of us. I, I know Denis, and it, it, it's very painful to see something that should be on the big screen to be on the small screen. But I mean, anybody who can predict where this is all going to shake out must have been snacking on psychedelic gummy bears because it, it's very hard to to figure out the where it's all going to go. I just I, I do think that people want to get back to the theaters. I mean, you, you know, they talk about the uh, the, the, the Zoom effect, the the, the the Zoom fatigue, right? I think I think that is real. I certainly feel it myself. I'm zooming all the time. I can hardly wait to get back to the theaters. I mean, I I do this annual postcard of my favorite uh, films, and I was looking at. Uh, there's only two of them that I saw in a theater. So the, for the first time in 25 years, I saw most of my movies on a small screen, which is which is crazy. I think you're getting some good laughs from the audience here on that yeah. psychedelic gummy bear <laughs> comment. Where where'd you pluck that from? 
Uh, straight out of my noggin. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know if they're available, but if they are, let me know. Uh, April, tell me this. I, you know, I guess there's been some discussion at the Academy Awards as well as to whether or not a movie that actually doesn't play in a cinema is actually a movie. If it's, if it's content that's created and goes straight to streaming, in your view, as a filmmaker, is it still a motion picture? This is an ongoing discussion as well. And do you qualify? Because currently the qualifications are a certain amount of screens and a certain amount of time frame. And, you know, where does that, where does that, where do we fit in now that we aren't on the big screen? My love is for the big screen and movies is to meant to be shared on the big screen in a community setting. And I am a lover of that. So uh, I guess time will tell. And I think this year there will be films that did not make it to the big screen, will still qualify and will still be considered a feature film. Hmm. Dan, if it doesn't show up at the Royal, is it really a movie? No, it's not. It has to be at the Royal to be a movie. <laughs> 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 no, story, storytelling is storytelling. And, and uh, despite what happens with COVID and how we eventually get out of this, um, storytellers will always exist. And, and these platforms are as, just as important as any other including the big screen, to, uh, to get your message out there. Alexandra, how worried are you about the fact that movies seem to be so many more now going straight to the streaming services and bypassing cinemas altogether? Well, it's a very, it's a changing landscape, and it, definitely, there's no getting around that. We just have to move with it, um, and uh, with the dissolution of uh, exhibition windows, I think we're going to see a lot more of things uh, being available in cinema and uh, online at the same time, and it will be up to audiences to choose. Ultimately, the cinema lovers like April and me and all of us on this call um, will go to the movies. I don't think we'll lose that. I think it's an innate human desire to share in story storytelling in a collective environment. I don't think that's going to go away. Um, I think the content will shift and our audience will shift with it, but it won't go away. You know, there is something, it's kind of bizarre if you think about it, as opposed to the comfort of your own home where you can do whatever you like, whenever you like, you can stop it, you can go to the fridge, you can, etc. People still, a hundred years later, want to sit in a crowded room with complete strangers and have that experience. It really All does. All about the popcorn. It's well. It's it's partly about the popcorn, I guess. Peter, you had your hand up. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I can I can second that emotion. You know, uh, the Sundance Film Festival starts tomorrow, and I'm going to be spending the next week in my basement in my office, going back and forth between screens, pretending I'm at a real festival, trying to watch between four and five movies a day. That's that is a lot harder than doing it in person. It's so much so much better doing it in person. Uh, I, I find the the psychic strain, I guess, moving back and forth, even though it's so convenient. It's not really that great. Hmm. April, just give us some insight into the business here. Are you going to, going forward, have to renegotiate what you do um, if, for example, that window for the movie theater is no longer there and you're going straight to streaming services? I guess so. Agents and managers are speaking about the bonuses that we normally get in terms of theatrical releases, because if you make a certain amount of box office, sometimes the director will get a bonus financially because either they've invested or reinvested their original fee. So the new world will have to shift and maybe it'll be like a certain amount of downloads or a certain amount of clicks or whether we're on iTunes for the top 10 for the first two weeks, maybe there'll be a financial bonus in the new kind of digital streaming aspects, but it will have to shift and be renegotiated and rethought through. And the industry doesn't have defined terms for that yet. Hmm. Okay. In our last two minutes here, let me give a minute each to the two people who run movie houses here and come full circle from what Peter hinted at at the beginning. There is optimism out there. Dan, what are you optimistic about? I'm optimistic that we all stay safe and positive and look forward to the future when we can all gather. Um, we are social creatures. Uh, it's not healthy for all of us to be locked in our living rooms and our basements. We need to get out and interact with each other. And that was the important um, aspect, I think, of the old single screen theater or refurbished single screen theater, as, as the region and the Royal have done, and the Paradise, um, is to go in and enjoy uh, a film together and have the opportunity to go out and discuss it and share it, share your thoughts. Um, we'll all just hope and, and pray that that day comes sooner than later. Alexandra, what gives you confidence that your business is going to come back? 
Well, I completely share the optimism and the hope that we will come back from this. And my hope is that we come back stronger. Our venue itself, the physical bones of the place will be uplifted, it will be an experience coming to the Regent that will be uh, new for people, old, people who have been our regulars and for our new audience as well. But I'm optimistic that we'll be able to actually cultivate a new audience. People who are suffering from Zoom fatigue, maybe a younger generation who are totally screened out at home and want a new experience and perhaps coming to the Regent is new for them. So I'm really excited about bringing people back together and expanding our audience and offer being able to offer being able to offer a shared experience to people again we are as everybody has said we're social creatures and i can't wait to bring that back whether it's 50 people or whether it's 450 people it's the one thing i've heard more than anything else over the past 10 months what people miss going to the movies i hear it all the time Alexandra Say, April Mullen, Peter Howell, Dan Peel, it's so good of all of you to spend some time with us on TVO tonight. Go and see Wander, everybody. Tommy Lee Jones, April Mullen's picture. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Next week, as part of Amazon's inaugural Canadian Audible original series, author and journalist Tanya Talega takes listeners on a journey of learning. It is both a departure from and a continuation of her previous work, which exposed racism and the terrible toll it's taken on Indigenous people in this country. The podcast is called Seven Truths, and it brings Tanya Talega back to our airwaves tonight from Toronto. Hi, it's really nice to meet you, even if it's just virtually. Honey, you know, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. And so it uh, feels like we know each other um, through social media. But yeah. I'm sad that we don't get the chance to actually physically meet. But I know that'll happen. She makes joke for saying that because uh, I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, so most of us know you from your writing, from your books, your newspaper columns. What spoke to you about doing a podcast? Hmm. You know, there is something about returning to oral storytelling, and uh, I have found myself doing a lot of speaking in the last several years, and to be quite frank with you, it's something that I never really saw myself doing, but as I did more and more of it, I realized the power of oral story, you know, and that's a power that our people have had for such a long period of time. But for me, I have been more of a, of a writer, someone who quietly writes things, you know, in a corner. And that's why I went into newspapers as opposed to TV or standing on a stage. But there is something about our tradition of oral story um, that really, really was speaking to me. And podcasts seem like the perfect place to do that in you know um, it's a way that we could use not just my voice but the voices of so many from our communities and tell our stories all together what are the seven grandfather teachings the seven teachings are love humility bravery wisdom honesty respect and truth now on this journey, you are not alone. You're with someone that means a lot to you. You're with an elder. Who is he and what does he mean to you? Miigwech for asking about Sam Ashnipaneskam. Sam means a lot to me. He has been someone who's been in my life since the inquest into the deaths of the seven fallen feathers. I first met Sam there. And uh, he actually was sitting in front of me in the courtroom. And I remember, um, you know, he's a tall man and he sat right in front of me and I couldn't see when he sat down. And um, I remember, you know, I, he had a long braid at the back of his, uh, his head and I wanted to pull it <laughs> and say, you know, Can you please move. I can't see anything. And um, uh, he seemed like a, a happy guy, a jovial guy. And I remember afterwards uh, going up to him and saying to him, um, just talking to him, just engaging him in conversation. And then I noticed that he was the elder for the families of the seven students. And we started talking like we had always known each other. And that began the a friendship that we have. And I still speak to Sam. In fact, I was speaking to him this morning. I speak to Sam uh, every day. And he helps me on, on my own journey. And so it seemed like the perfect 
he was the perfect person to bring forward on this podcast so Canadians could hear his voice explaining the seven grandfather teachings. Um, in the first episode, Love, you do discuss the seven fallen feathers, which you've been on this program talking about. Um, why was Love the appropriate theme for this awful tragedy? Hmm. You know, it's important that we remember that we're motivated by love love for our community, love for the people in our community, love for our ancestors, love for those that we have lost, love for our children. And all of the work that we do is not just for the here and now, it's for the generations and the generations that follow. It is for our children's children's children. And so when I was thinking about the teaching of love, I was thinking about Sam. I was thinking about the love that he has for our people the love that he has for our community and all of the things he's weathered in his life. You know, Sam is a survivor of three Indian residential schools and he still gets up every day. He's positive. Sometimes he can get like, you know, uh, he can get a little angry and, you know, wonder why things are the way they are. But in his heart, he's got his teachings and his role is to pass those teachings on to others to help inspire us to keep going, to keep fighting for our people. And that comes from love, as a place of sense of love that we all have. You mentioned that um, the podcast, you are telling stories from different people. You also share yourself a lot in this podcast, which I really appreciated, because I can understand it's probably not as, it's not a very easy thing to do. Um, I wanted to share a clip from one of the podcasts from the love episode. Um, let's take a listen. How can I walk a life every day of understanding, of peace and love, when our children are still dying in the waters of Thunder Bay, when our women are still being targeted and going missing, when our people are still incarcerated or shot and killed by police at high rates? How do I put aside the sorrow and anger of our society's failure to not judge a person by the color of their skin, but by the quality of their soul? The thing that um, stuck to me in my head is, how do you move um, every day and do this work? And that part where you said, how do I put aside the sorrow and the anger? How do you do that? Mm. That's a tough one, isn't it? You know, we all move in these circles um, to various degrees, but as an indigenous person, you carry these things with you, you know, and um, love motivates me. It's hard. It's hard every single day waking up, wondering what are you going to hear this morning? You know, what are you going to hear has happened in Thunder Bay or that has happened in one of our communities from coast to coast to coast? We live with this every single day. We live with police violence. We live with the fact that our people are populating the jails at like just incredible levels. We live with the fact that our women are still going missing and are still so badly treated in this country. We live with two tiers of justice. We live with our people still fighting for their basic treaty rights, for basic human rights, for the right to having clean water. How does one every day go forward and say today we're going to, I'm going to keep going and I am going to try and put on a brave face and a happy face? We do so through community. We do so through the people that we stand with. And I have to say that the people that I know and the people that are working for Indigenous rights across this country are wonderful. They are our youth. They are our elders. They are our leaders. They are our friends, our sisters, our brothers, our aunties, our uncles. And without them and that support, that continuum that we all feel, you know, I don't think I could do this work. And without them, I know I couldn't actually. You know, I came to this country as a refugee when I was um, maybe 10 years old. And I don't, I didn't really know very much about Indigenous people. And I'm ashamed to say that I didn't learn it in school. I only started to learn about it more when social media, um, like on Twitter. 
And, you know, I feel great shame in that. Even when I look at certain um, words, I can't pronounce them. I should be able to because we are on uh, Turtle Island. One thing that I really appreciate about this podcast is that there's a lot of history in it. And you're able to learn the history by learning from people who were there when those events happened. In episode five, Honesty, you talk about Shoal Lake 39 First Nation in Northern Ontario. What did that episode reveal? Thanks for asking about that episode. You know, it's an incredible story, and it's a story that, you know, you couldn't make up if you tried. It's a story of Shoal Lake 39, a community um, outside of Kenora, Ontario, a community that for over 100 years, the city of Winnipeg has been taking the water from Shoal Lake 39 and the other community is Shoal Lake number 40. Um, it's also right there. And a giant aqueduct runs from Shoal Lake to the city of Winnipeg, and it delivers Winnipeg clean drinking water every single day. So every day that the people of Winnipeg get up and they turn their taps on, they have their coffee, they have their shower, they're doing so with water from Shoal Lake 39, Shoal Lake 40. Now, the thing is, is that Shoal Lake 39 has never been compensated for the use of that drinking water. And they are unable to use the area and the land that they have lived on for thousands and thousands of years due to the fact that the city is taking this water and shipping it all the way to Winnipeg. And believe it or not, there is still law on Ontario's books that allows for this. But also hidden in that law, it states that they will compensate any party who is injured by the removal of this water. Yet there is Shoal Lake number 39, and they have never been compensated for the removal of this water. It's, you know, a story that is rooted in the story of Canada itself. You know, the story of taking, the story to failing to recognize our rights as people, failing to recognize treaty rights. Treaties are laws of the land. They built this country. They're not just some piece of paper that is worthless or means nothing, but Canada's courts and governments have treated it as such. The people of Shoal Lake 39 should be compensated, and that is what this story is about. This is a story, this is an episode of honesty and how Canada needs to be honest with itself. Does Canada have what it takes to be honest? You know, we are capable of being honest, but do we choose to be honest? Does the government choose to be honest? You know, there has to be political will in across this country. That political will has to start from the people itself. You know, um, you can change all the laws you want in the world, but unless the will of the people is behind the changing of those laws, nothing will get done. And so we need to make sure we have the hearts and minds of Canadians who push lawmakers to do the right thing mm -hmm. and who themselves do the right thing. And until we do that, we will never have equity in this country. You know, and we're talking about Shoal Lake and the removal of water for the people of Winnipeg at the expense of an entire First Nations community. And it's incredible to me, too, that, you know, the city of Winnipeg has grown and thrived off the fresh water of Shoal Lake. Yet there is Shoal Lake number 39. They have not had the chance to grow and to thrive and to be the the power that they need to be, the economic power that they need to be as well, because of the loss of their water. Do you think, um, um, as I said, there's a, you know, I think there is, it is fair to say there is a gap in how history is taught in Canada. Um, I hope I'm not wrong, but from my own experiences. Do you think it's fair to say that if people did know more about the history, that they would be moved to uh, maybe act more? Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the things that I often speak about is the need for education reform. You know, we need to tell our children the truth about what's happened in this country. We need to teach what has happened in the Indian residential schools that existed from the mid-1800s to 1996 in this country. Like you mentioned, you didn't know um, about First Nations people when you came here and, you know, you go to school and then suddenly you, you're finding out through social media, you're finding out through books and through your own learning of what the truth is. We will only build a good and equitable Canada when we start telling our children the truth 
And the truth is hard. You know, it's hard to admit that we have built a country without respecting treaties, without respecting nation to nation agreements. It's hard for Canadians to hear that there are two levels of citizens in this country. There are Indigenous people and there are non-Indigenous people. There are two sets of rights, you know. There's something called the Indian Act, which has governed the lives of every single status Indian in this country since 1876. And that is still law in Canada. Um, I think Canadians too. We do have. Um, we know very much. We know a lot about American history, and um, I thought it was interesting that through the podcast, you compared um, the Indian, the indigenous, the indigenous struggle in Canada to the Black Civil Rights Movement in America. Uh, in episode six, respect, you discuss uh, Kenora. Ontario. What happened there in 1974 um, that led to a civil rights uh, activism? Miigwech for asking about Anishinaabe Park. The Anishinaabe Park occupation happened in the summer of 74. And you know, it's something that should be written up in the history books across Canada. But of course, like many of our stories, it is not. But it is a history that people should know and that people should be proud of proud of for the fact that this was coming on the tail of the civil rights movement that was happening in the United States in the 1960s. This is coming on the um, on the tail of the of Wounded Knee, of Alcatraz Island, of the birth of the American Indian Movement, um, which actually happened in Minneapolis, Minnesota by Ojibwe people, by Anishinaabe people. And members of AIM were actually there in 1974 at Anasnabe Park. Now, Anasnabe Park is uh, a park, and it's within Kenora. And this was a meeting place for so long, for centuries. First Nations people would come down through the rivers in Kenora, and this is a place that they would stay. This is where they would lay their head. It was a gathering place. It was a meeting place. And that piece of land was taken, and it was turned into... Um, a park, and First Nations people were not consulted. This happened, and um, it was in the early 1970s when in the city of Kenora itself, a city that has struggled very much so with, with racism and a history of racism, um, the Ojibwe people in the area, they were holding a conference in the early 70s looking at things like the Indian Act, looking at the things like how come we can't get health care? How come we can't get dental care? Why are the police being so brutal to our people? Um, I talk about this in the episode of the amount of arrests, the incredible amount of arrests of First Nations people for drunkenness, um, getting people, um, homeless people, and removing them from the land. Uh, this was in the early 70s and of the abject police brutality that the people were experiencing. So a conference was held. A conference was held by the Ojibwe Warrior Society, which is a group of First Nations people who live in the area and said, you know what, this isn't okay anymore. And through that conference, it turned into an occupation of the park. And the occupation lasted, and it lasted. And we tell the story from one of the key figures who was there at the time, Lynn Skeed. And it's really quite amazing listening to her voice, you know, because she is a female warrior. She is someone that we need to hear. And I'm so grateful that she was able to talk to us. Her partner was Louis Cameron. And Louis Cameron was one of the Ojibwe Warrior Society founders who started the occupation in the park. And just an aside to that, they have a son. They have a son named Tyler. And uh, Tyler is also in the podcast, and he's reading the words of his father, remembering the days of the park, because Louis Cameron is lo no longer with us. And, you know, these voices of Louis Cameron and Lynn Skeed are voices that we need to hear. They are voices, and since the early 1970s, have been pushing for the exact same reforms and equities that we are still asking for today in 2020. Uh, you know, there's uh, another voice that we do hear on the final episode is somebody that's no longer with us. Um, in the final episode, Truth, you discuss the death of Barbara Kentner. Who was she? Barbara Kentner is, uh, was an Anishinaabe woman. She was a single mom. 
She was a loving sister. She had a family that loved her very much. And she was walking with her sister, Melissa, on a cold January night on the streets of Thunder Bay when a car passed them. And outside of a, the car, a metal trailer hitch was hurled at her and her sister. It hit Barbara square in the stomach. Barbara Kentner died that summer after the hitch hit her stomach, uh, traumatizing injuries that occurred in her in her belly. The story of Barbara Kentner is a story that speaks of truth. It speaks of the truth of what is happening to our women and girls in this country. It speaks to racism that Canada still has not has not faced. It speaks to the racism of Thunder Bay. It speaks to why it is our people can't seem to walk down the street with have racist insults hurled at them, pieces of garbage hurled at them, or in this case, a metal trailer hitch hurled at her. And so we hear the story of Barbara Kentner told through her sister, Melissa, who was standing with her when that hitch went flying and hit her in the stomach, her sister in the stomach. And we also hear the story of Barbara Kentner through the journalist Willow Fiddler, who was at the time she was with APTN, but she's now with the Globe and Mail. And she covered that story. You know, she was there and she is a First Nations woman who lives in the city of Thunder Bay and experiences Thunder Bay every single day. And so to me, it was really important to have Willow's voice and to have Melissa's voice. And also you hear Barbara's voice through Willow's reporting in this episode called Truth. Um, the man accused of killing her, Braden Bushby, is currently on trial for manslaughter. We've been talking a little bit about justice, and it is a theme throughout this podcast. Do you think Indigenous people can get justice in Canada's criminal uh, justice system? No, I don't. I think that we really need to change the system that we have now. It is a system that was set up not to defend and protect Indigenous people, quite the contrary. You know, you can just see the fact that, you know, I talked about this earlier, about the, the prisons overflowing with First Nations, Métis, Inuit people. Why is that, you know? Why is it that we have had a police force that um, in the last several months, many Indigenous people have died at the hands of the police? You know, um, when George Floyd died in the United States, I was mindful of what was happening in Canada, and many Indigenous people were mindful of the loss of life that our people have had at the hands of police here. You know, it starts from there. It starts from there. It looks into the court system. Why is it that it takes so many years for our land claims issues to finally come to pass, to finally be heard? Why is it that we are not properly represented in the justice system. You know, we are overrepresented in the prisons and underrepresented in the system itself. When you look at judges, when you look at lawyers, when you look at people that are stenographers, um, can we find justice in this country? We need a new way of doing things. And that's going to take, again, political will of everyone to realize what has happened in this country for the last 153 years has not been working, and we need a new way forward. Um, I just, we have about a minute and a half left. One of the episodes is titled Humility, and it kind of stuck with me because I think humility is on the individual to um, to figure out how they can be better, how what they what the, the role that they play. Um, Humility, uh, what role can humility play in these seven truths uh, with non-Indigenous people in Canada? Mm. You know, I thought a lot about that, too, when I was uh, writing humility. I was thinking of, you know, this this particular story, um, and this is a story that uh, I hope, an episode that I hope people will listen to about, um, about two women, the relationship between two women, uh, an Indigenous woman and a non-Indigenous woman in Thunder Bay, and of the birth of the Nietzsche Art Studio, and what it means to be an ally, and what it means to be humble, and what it means to recognize your place in society and giving space and voice to someone else. And when I was thinking about this episode, I was thinking, you know, there are so many lessons here for everyone in Canada. 
there are lessons of humility that we need to hear. We need to make space for other voices. We need to make space for First Nations voices. And we need to examine what it means to be an ally. You know, someone may think they're being a good ally, but are they? You know, um, it's difficult. It's difficult to unteach what you've been taught as a child, what you have grown up in systems that you have grown up in, education systems, you know, justice systems, government systems, systems that are, there's systemic racism, you know, that's where the term comes from. It is embedded. And the systems are, it's like they're drinking their own water, their own Kool-Aid. We need to take that away and to start afresh and make new, new systems that are free of the past. Um, Tanya, it's been such a pleasure to speak to you. Congratulations on this podcast. I really, um, I, I felt the connection between you and Sam and seeing what's happening right now with our elders and COVID-19, uh, it just brightened my heart. And hopefully one day in the after times, maybe I, we can meet up and I can buy Sam a Timmy's. <laughs> You know what? He would love that, I would like to say, and I would love that too. Yeah, but Miigwech I think... Miigwech for offering us this opportunity. Miigwech for this time, and uh, I know this is going to help people understand the history more, and the relationship between you is just great. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Miigwech, be well. You too. And that is the agenda for Thursday, January 28th, 2021. New, more contagious strains, vaccine shortages, and questions about how to deploy rapid COVID-19 testing. Tomorrow, we'll assess the latest challenges of this pandemic. Also, we'll hear from our Ontario hubs about why some still question Sudbury's municipal amalgamation 20 years later. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. And Nam Kiwanuka, we'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.